Security Grant Program EHP training for this afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is Simbri Ross, the Grants Program Manager for the Nonprofit Security Grant Program, along with Charles Man then the Grants Management Bureau Chief, and Tristan Reed, the Grants Management Officer, my supervisors with whom I consult if there are issues that arise regarding your project. Today we will focus on environmental and historic preservation. Please make sure that you have the following materials for this training, a PowerPoint presentation, EHP screening form, a training screening form, a form. Please mute your phone, and during the course of this training, you will be able to text or text questions. Uh, if you have any questions, any questions that's presented. All right, uh, so uh, as uh, Sembri indicated, um, we are uh, enabling uh, most of the uh, participants to uh, uh, perform chat functionality to the host. Um, so please, if you do have questions you'd like to have answered, uh, just queue them up in the chat, and then as, as we cover each section, we'll periodically pause to uh, uh, address any of the questions that come up that are relevant to that content. Uh, if you do have your phone's uh, ability to mute them, please do so. Uh, otherwise, uh, please try to minimize any background noise. We're trying to mute everybody's lines, but uh, every now and then one sneaks through. As you see on the first page of our PowerPoint presentation, today's agenda, just a brief reward of five topics, sub-awards, uh, quarterly status report, reimbursement request and payment, project file, and as we mentioned earlier, the EHP review and approval process. Only in reference to sub-awards, the outstanding matter might be whether you as the subrecipients have uploaded signed sub-award letters in SAASP. Everyone has been given their sub-award package, and at this point, the only thing that might be done or needed for completion is your signing the sub-award letter and uploading it in SAASP. On the second page of our presentation, we've given you a brief timeline, the earliest possible timelines that certain materials might be submitted by subrecipients. It is our hope as the SAA to complete all P&P reviews by next Friday. We have provided you with W-9s and ACH enrollment forms to complete, which are necessary to set you up in our financial system. We would like these documents returned as soon as possible, but no later than the 31st of December. EHP submissions might begin in the month of December. We think that the 31st of December, again, might be the earliest date for a complete submission. Quarterly status report will be due January the 10th and we are anticipating the beginning of FEMA approvals between January and March 2020. Thereafter, the earliest date that project is, uh, equipment installations may begin would be April 2020 and the submission of reimbursement requests June 2020. Yes, yeah, so what Sembri has uh, laid out there is uh, Certainly, after uh, regarding the EHP and the pro uh, anything beyond January is more of a notional timeline, just to kind of set expectations. Uh, if uh, any of this material that is submitted, especially the EHP material, if any of that comes in early and for some reason uh, FEMA is able to approve it at a very early and the work is done earlier, that's fine, that's really uh, high performers uh, may be able to get that done, uh, or if things just take longer, uh, if it takes longer to scope out uh, all the EHP materials, if it takes longer for FEMA to approve, it takes longer for the work to get done, you do have the full period of performance to accomplish that. Uh, so I think this is more just kind of to set the expectations if, if folks thought that they were going to complete their entire project before the end of the year, it's probably very unlikely. Um, but yeah, I think the, the key one is we do want to make sure we uh, have both your award letters signed and returned in SharePoint uh, as soon as possible. Really no work should be uh, done before then. Uh, we do want to get the project management plans all completed and approved, uh, so any lingering questions there should be resolved as soon as possible. And then jumping right into getting uh, your payment materials uh, submitted so you can get set up for payment and getting the EHP materials in. If we can finish the year with everybody approved, signed, uh, approved pro project plan, signed documents, EHP uh, submissions done uh, and payment materials uh, 
for a setup and payment done by the end of the year. That is going to be so far ahead of schedule, we'll be in a great spot. Uh, I imagine we'll just be following up next year uh, with everybody who doesn't have everything uh, in place so we can uh, narrow down our focus uh, to get those in. And just one note regarding the PMPs, the status, please remember to check your junk and spam files for FAA SP notifications. There are many uh, PMPs that are in need of revision. Be sure to read the bottom of your PMP or the FAA notification for what revisions are necessary and suggestions for language that might need to be removed or other changes that might need to be made for your PMP to be acceptable. On the next page, page three, a definite deadline for all subrecipients is the completion of the quarterly status report. You will have to submit quarterly status reports four times of, year, of the year. January 10th will be the time for the first submission. And in that quarterly status report, which will be completed online through the SAASP system, you'll report on your activity for what did you engage in, what was accomplished from October the 1st to December the 31st, 2019. The whole purpose of the, report is, of the report is to let us know your progress toward the completion of your project. You will also include current spending that is projected for the next quarter and any bits that have been identified which are hindering your progress, whether you have had problems submitting your EHP screening material or any other issues that has arisen. Again, we will send an email with instructions on how to submit your quarterly status reports probably in the latter part of December or the very early part of January. And one note on quarterly status reports is that uh, the, the quarterly status report form essentially is, uh, is drawn from your approved project management plans. So that's why we really want to make sure everybody has an approved project management plan in the system so that when uh, the December rolls around and we, the uh, quarterly status report forms start being generated, it'll be pulling all that information from your most recent court, uh, approved project management plan and you're reporting on an accurate project management plan. Many people have asked us about what will be necessary for reimbursement. You have been provided with a W-9 and an ACH enrollment form for completion. The W-9 is an absolute necessity and make sure that it is signed and dated by whoever is completing it the ACH payment is an option, automated clearinghouse payment. Again, you would complete the enrollment form if that is the means of payment that you would prefer. However, if you would prefer to be paid by check, send an email to me directly to let me know that. Make sure when you complete the ACH enrollment form that the second portion of it is completed by your bank official and it also must be properly signed. One, a couple of notes on the uh, getting set up for, uh, to receive payment. Uh, first uh, is that for those individuals who are receiving uh, payments for, or will be receiving payments for the first time and are, have not previously received an award from, uh, from DCH SEMA and haven't currently uh, previously done business with the District of Columbia government, when your uh, payment account essentially is, is set up by the CFO and the DC Treasury, uh, you may receive an email from them uh, indicating that you have your payment information has been completed or updated. Uh, so that is a new practice that the DC Treasury is doing is that they are notifying people when their payment information is either initially created or changed. So, if, uh, so we're hoping to get all that done uh, very fairly shortly now so that everybody will get those notices uh, in in a short period of time so you'll remember that we've talked about this. Uh, we'll set that up uh, as, soon as, quick, as soon as you send it to us. And also, even if you have currently um, a W-9 on file, if it's a subaward from 2018, there probably might not be a need to resubmit a W-9 again, but if your projects or W-9 might have been submitted before 2018, there was a new form that was mandated for our use by the Office of the Chief Financial Officer. So the better part of valor would be to submit a new W-9 if you have not submitted one within the last year. Same for the ACH enrollment form. 
The next thing in terms of documentation necessary for reimbursement. Your reimbursements will consist of two things that are sent to me, invoices and proof of payment. An invoice should indicate the vendor that performed work for you, that installed equipment or other labor associated with the installation of equipment, the amount of the work done, the date of purchase, and it should be thorough and itemized so that we can tell what was done by your vendor. Proof of payment should be either a canceled check or an itemized credit card statement showing purchase or payment of the invoice. The amount should be clear so that we can match it up to your project management plan. And this is, I think, uh, a very important point uh, that Sembri made about clear documentation uh, because uh, we, we would hope to avoid the uh, situation in which you're sending uh, uh, several different amounts in for payment and we can't figure out how you arrived at the total you're requesting or even what total you're actually asking to be paid for. So if, especially if you're submitting multiple invoices uh, with different proofs of payment uh, or if it's a split invoice where some items were charged to nonprofit grant and some items you're paying for out of other funding sources, the, the more clearly you can organize that and make it easy to determine what you're requesting payment for and how you derive that total and how that corresponds to the proofs of payment you're providing, uh, that will really make our lives a lot easier uh, and make it uh, much quicker to process the payment. Another, th another thing to consider is that uh, we want this, uh, the final product to be audit proof. Uh, we, while you might be familiar with your project and, and what you did, uh, and we might be familiar with what your project was all about and how those costs are allowable, we may have to present this payment material to an external auditor uh, down the road who isn't familiar with the program or you or us. Uh, and so the easier it is to explain to a complete stranger how all this makes sense, uh, the easier it'll be to uh, ensure that you have a, a, a well-documented package for reimbursement. And again, just a reminder, at no juncture do you engage in any kind of expenditure before you have EHP approval, not even deposits pool vendors for or based on proposals. As you know, the SAA has a repository for documents, our SAA SP system, but it is incumbent upon all subrecipients to maintain their own project files, be they electronic or binders or some other means of retaining the documents that are set forth. Your project file should consist of your subaward letters, your uh, terms and conditions, any guidance for your grant, adjustment notices, EHP documentation and approval letter, all correspondence that is relevant that you have with our agency, the subrecipient handbook, your project management plan, your contracts, purchase orders, invoices, proof of payment, any reimbursement request sent to me, QSRs, and proofs of work completed. And this is a, a good point that uh, while the, the SharePoint system is there for uh, our use and for your use, and we do hope that uh, it is there to support you, um, there is an expectation uh, in the way the federal government uh, lays out the responsibilities of the awarding agency and the receiving entity that the receiving entity, uh, that would be your organization, uh, does maintain its own uh, files respond, uh, relating to the grant. Uh, so please do uh, set up early on, if you haven't done it already, a, a file organization structure on your side uh, where you can keep all the materials that are relevant to this project uh, and hopefully then the, the things that you're giving us in SharePoint are also reflected on your side. And all the documents that are entered electronically in the FAA SP system, you can't easily PDF and make copies of paper copies for any paper files that you retain or any electronic files that you have in your organization. The focus of this presentation, as we also mentioned, is environmental and historic preservation. Basically, uh, when you receive your terms and conditions and also the notice of funding opportunity, uh, one thing that subrecipients must do to be compliant to receive grant funding is to make sure that they comply with all the terms of environmental and historic preservation. The concern of EHP is whether projects will have an impact on the integrity of historic uh, buildings or the environment. 
particularly in this case, ground disturbance. And since the nonprofit security grant program is primarily at its core a uh, physical uh, facility target hardening uh, program, the expectation on our side and on FEMA's side is that almost every nonprofit security grant program will have elements in it uh, that will require the EHP review, be it installation of fences, uh, replacement of cameras, uh, running electrical power cords to, those, to a camera, uh, replacing windows, doors, locks. Uh, all that kind of stuff is the kind of thing that would require EHP, uh, and it is the most common type of activity under NSGP. There are some uh, narrow uh, areas that are allowable under NSGP that uh, are, would not require EHP, uh, and if you do have any of those activities going on in your project, be it training uh, or a uh, planning activity uh, or the newly approved uh, uh, contracted security personnel, uh, for a facility, some of those areas will, would not require EHP, but it would really be important to carve those out uh, and clearly identify them in your project plan uh, to explain how parts A, B, and C of your project are exempt from EHP approval, whereas parts D, E, and F require EHP approval. So the things that tend to require EHP approval are physical security enhancement, both interiorly and exteriorly. So that would be Things such as doors, lights, fences, walls, bollards, alarm systems, access control systems, video surveillance systems, anything that must be um, affixed to a wall or in any other way attached to an interior portion of your facility or exterior portion. If you have lights and light poles that are going to be installed in the perimeter of your property, Again, because that would involve ground disturbance, it must receive EHP approval. You've been uh, given an EHP screening form to complete. Uh, for future reference, please use the EHP screening form that we provided and annexed or attached to this invitation because the keystroke limitations do not exist. You can type to your full desire whatever text is necessary to adequately describe your project. So for the purposes of this training, we're going to be refer to a training EHP screening form yeah. that's been completed. So uh, the first thing we'll touch on right before we get into the form itself is the, uh, the process, just so you understand what steps uh, go, it goes through. Uh, the first step is that you would complete the EHP screening form describing the work that you're doing in your project, uh, answering the questions in the form, and we'll walk through the form in great detail later, uh, and attaching all the necessary documentation, uh, and then providing it to us. Uh, you would not provide any information directly to FEMA. They want uh, us to collect those forms and, uh, and the materials and submit it to FEMA ourselves. Uh, so send it to us. The best way to get it to us is if you complete everything, uh, put it into either a single file or a, a manageable number of files uh, and attach it in the attachment section in the SharePoint system. Uh, and then that will give us a notification that something has been attached and we'll receive it. Uh, and then once we've reviewed it, determined that it's complete, we'll send it to FEMA. So when we send it to FEMA uh, Grants Programs Directorate, uh, it starts off at their headquarters branch uh, and they do an initial type of review. Uh, some projects uh, are approved at that level. They're approved at the initial review level uh, because they have no potential impact on the environment, no potential impact on historic properties, uh, and there's basically nothing controversial about them, and they get uh, a relatively quick approval, hopefully. Uh, if there are any additional questions that come up, for instance, if your property is in a historic district uh, or if your facility itself is uh, over 45 uh, years old uh, or is on the historic you know, register list uh, or if the ground disturbance that you're performing is in a floodplain or something else that has potential to impact any of these variety of uh, different federal regulations, then the initial reviewer on FEMA side will kick it up uh, to uh, either another federal agency to review uh, or up to the, reg the FEMA Region 3 office, uh, which is in Philadelphia. Uh, FEMA breaks up the country into various regions, and the things that need additional review will be done at the regional level. Uh, that 
a FEMA regional officer may then consult with other federal agencies uh, or may go right back down to the historic, uh, the State Historic Preservation Office in D.C., Maryland, or Virginia, depending on where your facility is located. Uh, and then that review will happen there. You might get more questions back. Again, the questions will come from FEMA to us, from us to you, and then we'll pass the responses back the same way. Uh, the back and forth with additional review can take as long as it takes for FEMA to get the answers they need, uh, and that is the, probably the biggest thing that will delay a project is if it uh, has a significant uh, amount of questions on any of these uh, relevant uh, issues, the biggest one being historic pr properties. Um, what, as far as timeline goes, FEMA will notify the SAA in no, le no more than 45 days of the review status. That sounds like a lot. Uh, free, we have seen easy EHPs get approved in much less than that, uh, but at a bare minimum, they will tell us where things are at within 45 days. So if you've submitted something to us, uh, uh, give us a, a little bit of time to review it, uh, and we will then submit it to FEMA. If, we, if you have not heard back anything uh, from us within 45 days, you, or a little bit over 45 days, that might be when you might want to check with SEMBRI to see uh, do we have an update from FEMA, and if, if we're beyond 45 days of submission, we'll check with FEMA and they'll tell us where it's at. And we do want to note uh, to make sure that you have realistic expectations. We have had FEMA EHP approval in as short as four days, but we have had it take as long as eight months, depending upon how complicated the project may be. Uh, and after we are notified by FEMA of the approval of your project, we will send a notification to you and indicate in an email that you're able to expend now grant funding. So in reference to the EHP screening form, there is a current version that, again, was attached as an email, a 2017 PDF fillable document. Please do not use any other form of this document other than the one that we've provided. Again, the character stroke limitations are a real issue, and with what we've provided, there is the ability to type whatever you need to type without any limitation. And you'll note, in reference to the first uh, section of the document, the section A, project information, the DHS grant award number in this instance will be uh, provided by our office, but for the purposes of this exercise, we have a prior grant year. For this current grant year, the uh, grant award number is EMW-2019 UA-00061. Again, we will provide it, but do not worry about it. Yeah, the main point here is that the, uh, the first couple of lines uh, are not yours to fill out, so you don't need to worry about that. The award number, the grant program, the grantee, the grantee point of contact, the mailing address, and the email, that's all us. Uh, you are the subrecipient, so you would fill out the subgrantee portion uh, indicating uh, your organization's uh, name, uh, who the point of contact is, the mailing address, email, uh, and the estimated cost of the project. And normally you would be indicating truly the subaward amount. There should not be an inconsistency. The project title will always be target hardening. For project location, you will indicate the location of your facility. Um, and for project, or you could also provide longitude and latitude, but it is preferable for you to use your actual physical address. In the project description, what we want to know from you is basically what does your project consist of? We want to to be specific to what is the equipment that will be installed, the quantity of the equipment, where it will be installed, and if possible to include the authorized equipment list AEL code. This is not a place to go through a recitation of what makes you vulnerable necessarily or what was uh, included in your investment justification. You have gotten the subaward. There's no need to repeat that information. It can be very, very concise, but we need to be able to follow it. Please do not cut and paste from uh, proposals or cut sheets where the narrative is not clear. And it's worth pointing out that in this entire forum, this one section here under project description is the only place where you really get to describe really what you're doing. Every place else, it's uh, some specific questions to specific elements of the project. 
this is the only place where you get to lay out the project as a whole. Uh, so I think this is the best place to just describe this is what we're doing and uh, you know, summarize it. And then as you get into the subsequent portions of it, you can then refer back to those portions that you've already listed here. In the next section, section B, project type, you'll indicate the type of project this consists of. For most of the uh, sub recipients of subawards, you're going to be checking the box purchase of equipment. If it's a training or exercise that is classroom-based, there would not be a need to complete an EHP screening form. We want to encourage you also, if you're completing this document, to save your materials frequently. So normally you will be checking just the first box, purchase of equipment. There may be on occasion a need to uh, check the box renovation, upgrades, and modifications. But if you have any questions, you can email me. For the next section, Section C, Project Details, uh, Purchase of Equipment. For the first line A, you are supposed to specify the type of equipment and the quantity. If you're going to have five types of a particular type of camera, please indicate the quantity and the camera. For the second line B, indicate the corresponding AEL code. And I think this is a good place to point out one of the um, uh, quirks of this particular PDF form that, that FEMA has, uh, requires us to use. Uh, if you look at the sample answer that's being displayed in, in section 1A, specify the equipment and the quantity of each, uh, you see that in that blue box, uh, there's a little plus sign in the bottom corner. That indicates that there's more text that exceeds the size of the box that's being displayed. So if you were to click in that box and just scroll to the right, you'll see there's quite a lot of text there, actually. Uh, and this is, uh, I think, uh, a, it's something we can't really fix, but uh, you, what you, you may want to, uh, if you have a lengthy amount of text to type in there, you might want to type it either in a Word document or something else and then copy paste it in because it can be kind of awkward to type a lot of material in a box where you can only see a few uh, bits of it at a time. Uh, and again, this is just a limitation of the, the FEMA's template. Uh, so we'll do, I think if you can figure out how to work around uh, its limitations, uh, that's, that's our best advice is just copy paste it in. From section C, project details, you will then go to section D, project details regarding project installation. And in this section, in the top box for box A, you will tell us not only what equipment will be installed, but how. Meaning, will the cameras be mounted on walls? Will wall packs be affixed to walls? Will uh, bollards be placed outside of the facility uh, on uh, your driveway or near your driveway. If a fence would be installed, there is a section for B in the box, exactly what will the ground disturbance be to install that particular type of equipment, such as a fence. The narrative there shows you what FEMA will be seeking, the depth of holes that must be drilled, the width of holes that must be drilled for posts for fences. Yeah, and uh, it's, I think it's important to answer some of those questions as, as accurately as you can uh, and to consider all the possible uh, work that would need to be done to install uh, the equipment that you're installing. Uh, one example would be uh, if you're putting uh, lights in, uh, po on posts in the parking lot, uh, would you need to dig up the parking lot to run new electrical power uh, or would they be running off of an existing electrical power supply? Uh, the, the more you can think out those things ahead of time, the easier it'll be to completely answer all these questions and, and have uh, accurate answers. And if there is no ground disturbance, please remember to check the box indicating no for question B. The electrical system, uh, distribution system question is question C, indicating yes or no. You must, in question two, indicate the age of your structure. You must also thereafter indicate whether there are any buildings or structures that are over uh, 45 years old. And please include if there are renovations or rehabilitations or modifications to your structure, the years of those renovations, modifications, or renovations. For question B, in the proximity of your, your building, 
Are there any buildings that are 50 years or older adjacent to your project area? If there are not, then check the box no. If your uh, site is listed on the National Registry of Historic Places, again, yes or no. I think the questions are self-explanatory. Now, uh, one question that has uh, come up that uh, was asked in the, uh, the chat from one of the meeting participants uh, was uh, whether if the delay in receiving uh, EHP uh, submission and approval to proceed uh, would push some of your, uh, your timelines uh, back uh, further than what was originally scoped out in your project plan, if, there's a, if you would be penalized for that and the answer is no, uh, clearly we, want, we would prefer that you would, uh, once you have an idea of what your adjusted timelines are, to go ahead and just ask for the project plan to be sent back so we can, uh, you can revise it. And if that means pushing back some of your, your due dates, uh, as long as it accurately reflects what you think is going to happen, uh, that's fine. Um, and then as we go through and do our quarterly reports every quarter, if another adjustment is needed some time further on down the line, uh, it's best for the PMP to be accurate, uh, and that's, that's the most important thing. We, the grant is a three-year period of performance grant. We started off issuing two-year awards just because we want people to kind of get through the projects early and have that last year for emergencies. Uh, but that, we have three years uh, if, we, if we really, really need it. And I don't think that any project that was funded under nonprofit uh, would not be able to be accomplished within three years uh, if uh, everybody's doing what they can to finish it. In this section, section three, the final page of your EHP screening form, site photographs, maps, and drawings. Again, you'll be asked uh, to attach photographs of the site labeled uh, color ground level photographs for the project site, please indicate and check the box. They are required. A colored photograph of each location where equipment will be installed or attached to the building or structure. So in this instance, for instance, if there are 50 cameras being installed in 50 different locations in your building, we should have 50 separate photographs of equipment location. Uh, they would be floor to ceiling photographs showing where the camera would be installed, normally with some type of asterisk or star to show the specific camera location. We want aerial photographs of your project site. You can easily get these using Google Maps, as well as uh, aerial photographs that show the extent of ground disturbance if applicable. Also, uh, label colored ground level photographs that show the uh, exterior side of your structure only if the building is more than 45 years old. If you have site plans or any other plans, they might also be attached, but they are not required. And so uh, I think we'll have a couple of examples uh, coming up of some uh, well done uh, EHP photos and how they're labeled. I think basically the, the point here is that FEMA is reading your narrative, but they don't know what your facility looks like or where you are. And so everything you can give them to understand your location and then what, what your facility looks like and what work is being done in and around it, the easier it'll be for them to approve it the first time. Uh, they, the, as somebody mentioned, the uh, aerial photography, Google Maps is a great solution for that. Um, if you, just so FEMA can understand, like, are you in the middle of an open field or are you in the middle of a highly urbanized area? Is there a uh, potentially a uh, you know, 100, 200 year old church sitting right next to you? That kind of thing. It helps FEMA contextualize where you're at. Uh, it'll also give you the opportunity if you want to use an edit tool to show the boundaries uh, of your uh, property if it's not clear. Uh, potentially that would be how you could maybe mark off where a fence is going in or where the lights in the parking lot are going in. Um, and then for interior uh, or ground level photographs, again, pr thinking about the context, uh, just taking a photograph of just the corner of your building where the camera's going, but you're, if you're so close to the wall you can't see anything else, that might not be all that helpful, but if you step back a little bit just so you can put the, uh, the photograph in context, I think that's really what would help them understand what's going on. Again, because FEMA has to assess the impact of the equipment installation on the integrity of historic buildings. So when you have a floor to ground ceiling, uh, uh, floor to ceiling photograph, that does give FEMA the context necessary 
to be able to see exactly how this equipment impacts the installation or the installation impacts the historical nature of the property. If we're able to go to the PowerPoint presentation, on the 11th, 12th, and 13th page are examples of the type of photographs that will be expected by, P by FEMA. So here's an example. This is a, a faked up example that FEMA provided uh, of a notional uh, camera project at Union Station. Uh, and here we have a you know, ground level photo. Uh, it's taken from an, with enough distance that you can actually see what's around uh, the area, uh, but it's close enough where you can actually kind of make out where they're going to put these cameras. They've used a, a marking tool to just uh, edit the, the, the picture, either in PowerPoint or Word or Publisher. There's a variety of uh, photo editing uh, tools. Even Microsoft Paint can be used to insert that kind of, uh, those kinds of marks, just showing that there are going to be five cameras, one's on that post, one's on that wall, one's over there, and further down. Uh, it also indicates in the narrative that they're facing south. That's helpful information. That way also the, uh, when FEMA is looking at it, they can compare that to the, uh, the Google map type aerial photos. So they can kind of figure out, oh, where in the property am I right now? Uh, it's the facing south in the rail yard. And the next picture on page 12 gives you a, a better sense of interior installation. You see that the photographs show you exactly where the cameras will be installed. They are labeled, it says proposed camera locations, and the stars represent where each camera will be located. And we just want to note one thing in reference to EHP, there's not a specific deadline when these uh, screening forms are due. We want you to do a good and thorough job in getting them to us as soon as possible. But again, this is a two-year project. The timeline that we provided in the beginning, again, was notional. Uh, if we start to get EHP screening forms in December of this year, that's great. But really and truly, there is no deadline for the submission of this material. Here's another example of, uh, of the Union Station project. Uh, in this case, this is the aerial photo. This is just printed out of uh, a Google map. You can even see the uh, branding down in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, and they've done a really good job here because what they've done is they've taken a red marker tool and just noted the boundaries of what Union Station's property lines are. So that even though you're, you know, this photo is from a few hundred feet up in the air, uh, this way you can see, oh, this is Union Station. It's not the building next to it. It's not the building south of it. Uh, and then they've gone in and uh, marked in the camera locations and labeling them again. And so you could cross-reference this to the ground level photo. Uh, and then that other marking they have out front, they, in their project that they're describing, they were proposing putting bollards uh, out in front of the building. So they've just drawn a yellow line in front of the building where they expect those bollards to go. Now, a, a really good pr submission would have probably also provided a ground level photo of the front of Union Station with similar markings showing where the bollards are actually going to go. Uh, but this is a kind of an example of how uh, you can put together these kinds of uh, the additional documentation to supplement the narrative. And there was a question regarding how many uh, camera locations can be shown as one photo. As we've indicated in uh, slide 12, for instance, the photograph there shows three proposed camera locations. If that particular photograph could encompass more camera locations provided that it's clearly labeled, that would be fine. But it must be very specific in showing proposed camera locations. Oh, one more note on, on that, uh, if, if in the photograph, if you're saying you want, are going to install a camera at, at this location and in the photograph there's already a camera there, it might be helpful either in your narrative or in the, in the labeling of the photo to explain whether you're adding a new camera uh, in addition or if you're, if you're replacing the existing one. We've had that come up in a couple times in the past where uh, an item's already there and the question comes back, well, are they replacing it or is this something extra? And if you address that up front, that'd be helpful. Um, jumping back into, uh, actually, can we skip back to the form really quickly? It'll answer one of our questions that we had. Uh, at the very end of the form in Appendix A, um, there's uh, a question about has there been any previously approved uh, environmental documentation. Uh, and this is, for instance, if you are a previous NSGP recipient and you've gone through an EHP approval for some other project at your facility, you could answer that question yes and uh, identify uh, that and 
uh, either by name or by the, uh, the reference number, uh, that might help FEMA speed through this process a little bit. If they've already answered a bunch of questions about your facility uh, and your neighborhood and the rest of it, uh, they can just refer back to their prior work uh, and do, get their answer faster. Or if, for instance, if you are in a historic district and you've done some kind of previous renovation or previous work on your facility and you've already had to go through your state historic preservation office uh, or your local community board for some kinds of approvals, uh, that might be something if, that you might re reference uh, in, in your application here uh, because, again, that might speed up the process of figuring out have some of these questions already been answered. Uh, but if you, even if you have, uh, if you're a prior nonprofit recipient and you've had a previous EHP approval at your facility, let's say you're a tw in 2017, you still have to go through this process for 2019, but referring to your prior approval might go a lot faster. If there are any other questions, please feel free to continue with the chat. Again, we wanted to note some of the problems that we have had in the past with EHP screening forms, which will result in a back and forth between our office and with the subrecipients to try to get the best information possible. Again, using the correct template is of utmost importance. Please do not use an old or an outdated EHP template. Um, please provide the information in the spaces per, uh, that are designated for the type of information sought, not describing the project in the space provided at the end of a section. Uh, you must also provide building age. By not providing building age, again, we will have to go back and forth with you to get the information so that your form is complete. If you don't submit photographs or if you submit photographs that are not labeled, again, we will have to continue to request that information from you. And if I am not mindful of the status of your EHP approval the review, please feel free to contact me at any point to remind me that your project is outstanding. So we don't want to lose track of approval status. One thing that we will do to help both us and you remember where things are at with EHP uh, is during our review of your quarterly reports, uh, at probably not in the January report, but starting in uh, the March report, uh, we will start uh, indicating uh, by providing you feedback every quarter thereafter uh, whether you, if you have not received EHP approval. It's not necessarily a, a black mark against you. It's more of a, a reminder that, you know, as every quarter goes by, if we have not received final EHP approval or if FEMA, has, if you have not submitted your EHP request to us, that there's miles yet to go before we can actually uh, complete the project. So we'll just keep on reminding on a quarterly basis uh, starting in the spring if we have not received the EHP approval from FEMA. So please try to have your information in this room be as clear and concise as possible. And again, if there's material from cut sheets or from product brochures, please edit it and organize it so that the major equipment being installed is obvious to a reviewer. Okay. All right, so uh, we have reached the end of our scheduled agenda. We do have a couple of questions queued up uh, in the chat. Uh, as we go through answering them, if you have additional questions, please feel free to add more. Uh, or if you'd rather uh, ask a question offline, uh, send an email uh, to myself or Sembri, uh, and we will try to pull, pull together all these questions and answers and also uh, publish a, uh, a frequently asked questions summary uh, after this is all completed. So uh, one question has come up, and this isn't necessarily unique to EHP, uh, but it's a question about uh, budgeting. Uh, if an estimate was made uh, up front that uh, you would have to install 20 cameras and it would cost a certain amount of money, uh, and then as you're getting quotes in and getting closer to implementing, you realize that uh, either you're coming, uh, you have it, the, the amount is less uh, or more, uh, either one really would have the same result. If you need to change the, the budget as it's laid out in your project plan, uh, just go ahead and uh, notify Sembri that uh, you have a change in your, in your approved budget and you need to move some things around. Probably best to kind of lay it out in an email uh, so that we know what you're trying to do. Uh, and then at that point, if it looks like it's not a problem, we'll go ahead and send the project plan back to you in SharePoint so you can update your project plan and resubmit it so that we're always looking at an accurate picture of what you're doing. Uh, moving money between um, 
elements that were in your original application uh, is relatively uh, uncontroversial and uh, is easily approved. We understood that back last spring you might not have the best grasp of what a security camera might cost. Uh, that's fine. Uh, it's when you start uh, proposing new expenditures uh, or things that were not in the original application, uh, that is the kind of thing that if it's uh, too significant, we might have to go back to FEMA for approval. Um, and we re really do want to keep those to a minimum uh, because, again, this was a competitive grant. Uh, your project was approved based on how you described it initially, so adding new items uh, or eliminating items that were in it to begin with, it, it may be the kind of thing that might not be approved, but uh, please let us know uh, up front as soon as you know these things happening. And the reason why the EHP screen form um, has, what you've been provided with has eight pages, eight pages that require your providing answers and information regarding your project. The original online version had 12 pages with four pages being examples of photographs and other information that might be helpful in completing an EHP screening form, but this form is concise and all that you need to complete your EHP screening form for your project. Another question uh, came up regarding uh, the difference between uh, the award package and the project management plan. Um, and just to kind of answer that, the award letter uh, is basically us sending you the award saying you are agreeing to these terms and conditions to fall if, uh, under this grant program. Your signature of the award letter is you're accepting the terms and conditions of the award and agreeing to uh, carry out that project. Um, part of the terms and conditions is to carry out the project that's in your approved project management plan. So signing the award letter is not the same as having an approved project management plan. Uh, put, but that should be your, probably your first step is getting the award letter signed. Uh, and then once that's done, you would then be required per the terms and conditions uh, of the award to fill out a project management plan. That should then be approved uh, and that would be a first step before uh, moving forward with the project. Okay, in reference to moving money around, this is not an EHP issue. This is really a project management plan issue. Uh, we want you to accomplish the deliverables that were set forth in your investment justification, the uh, basis of your award. We w don't want a lot of variation in the expenditures from your original investment justification, but I think as Charles mentioned, we expect some changes but they must be the activities described in your investment justification and subsequently in your PMP. In section C of the project, I'm sorry, in section C of the EHP screening form, yes. there's a question about project details, purchase of equipment. There really is not a limit on what can be typed there. Uh, there should not be any uh, problem with your typing fully. All of the equipment that's going to be installed uh, for your project. And please do not put things like video surveillance system or access control system or alarm system. You must in this section project type details indicate the components of these projects. If your video surveillance system consists of two monitors, one DVR, five cameras, each component needs to be listed. The same thing for alarm systems and access control systems. If there are going to be five key, uh, key fobs, ten card readers, it needs to be specified each component. Yeah, and I think the, the confusing part about this one, the, this section, and also the, the other narrative sections in the entire form is that they, will, they won't expand to include all the text visible, but it should all fit, it's just you won't be able to see it, you'll have to scroll across to see all of it. Again, another reason why if you have a lengthy uh, bit of text to put in there, you may be best off to write it somewhere else and then copy paste it in. Uh, otherwise, it can be a little bit awkward to use. There have been some individuals or some subrecipients that have submitted EHP documents that have not yet been reviewed. One reason why they've not been reviewed is because we had not had the training and the PMPs have not been approved. Many PMPs have not been approved. However, if you are comfortable with your submission and feel that it's thorough and complete and it would not involve any changes, and meets the guidelines that we provided through this training, then you would not have to revise any EHP material that you have uploaded 
as an attachment in SAASP for the 19 award. So if you mean EHP forms completed for this award, then it will be reviewed. If you mean for some prior year, you would need to submit a new EHP screening form. We might need more clarity on what you mean by prior EHP uh, material. Uh, and also, if, because there are some older versions of the uh, EHP form floating around in various forums, if, if you've already begin, begun work or have already submitted an EHP form for this current award using an old template, probably the best bet is to just copy everything into the new template because FEMA has started ratcheting down and not accepting uh, the old template anymore. They might just reject it out of hand. Uh, and so I, I think that the best bet is to make sure we're submitting uh, to FEMA using the new template in all cases. In terms of ACH payment, a lot of the turnaround time for payment really does depend on the completeness of the documents that have been provided. And some things might also depend upon the time of year that they are provided. We will try to make every effort to get payment to you uh, within a month of submission. Uh, but also we do possibly face backlogs if there's a problem with the office of the chief financial officer or if in some way any information provided is incomplete. So I think a good rule of thumb would be uh, check back if you have not received payment within 45 days. Uh, that gives us uh, two weeks internal to our office to get everything through and the CFO then would have its uh, 30 days to, uh, under the DC Quick Payment Act to uh, process the payment. I would hope that things go faster than that, but don't think that it's overdue unless you're at 45 days from submission uh, and haven't received any uh, questions or, uh, or any rejection of the request due to incomplete documentation. Uh, and of course, as always, the better documented and clearer it is on the front end, the faster it goes through our process. Now, in reference to the completion of Section C, if you know that you want an access control system but you don't have uh, an idea of what the components would be, I think then it would be premature at this time for you to submit an EHP screening form. You should have more specific information available to you to complete an EHP screening form because it would defeat the purpose to submit one prematurely and you have no specificity of what equipment will be installed. So don't feel under a time constraint to uh, submit this to us in December or January or February. Submit it to us when you realistically know what the equipment will consist of. We do want the best information you have available. Uh, what will your systems consist of? And the specificity of the information is very important in terms of things being reviewed by FEMA. I would suggest not submitting anything where you have a lack of clarity. Yeah, I think, I think Samri makes a good point there because it'll be very difficult to describe, especially in marking up your photos, what's going where if you don't know at this point what's going where. Will it require a uh, panel installation on the wall next to the door? Will it require a camera over uh, on the lintel of the door? Or is it just all going to happen inside the, uh, the locking mechanism? There are different types of access systems, and if you don't know what you're planning on getting, you might not know how it's being installed, and there are some questions in the EHP form that you might not be able to answer. First question, uh, this is, might invite me fairly unique uh, to the, the in organization that requested it, is, is there a required time that the equipment has to remain in place? Uh, not really, uh, although if you are aware that you're going to be leaving this facility soon, you might want to reconsider whether the project is going to provide you uh, the benefits you'd like to have out of it. Uh, that's one, depending on, on how pressing your, uh, your, your timeline is on, you might want to contact us to, so we can figure out exactly what uh, your situation is. But just in general, FEMA is not looking to penalize anybody. They're trying to help. So uh, if the project is completed and then two years down the road, it turns out you're going to relocate, well, at least you had two years' worth of the benefit of this project, and that's a benefit. And in reference to completing your PMP, you did not submit different PMP, I'm sorry, EHPs based on the category or type of equipment that you're dealing with, you will combine your entire project on one screening form. So you wouldn't have one EHP for cameras and another one for fence and another one for wall. It would all be in the same EHP screening form and photographs provided for every type and all types of equipment that your project consists of. And 
And one more question. Again, if you don't know fully what your project consists of, it does, your EHP screening form can wait until you have that information. I think that if you have that information in a month or two months, it does not in any way halt your project substantially. So please wait to submit your EHP material when you have the best specificity possible. And I think that one thing we have seen that, that some uh, sub recipients in, have done is that they have built in uh, time in their project management plan for that first portion of the, of the period to be nailing down all the specifics of their project, getting all their documentation together, and then submitting the EHP uh, request. If you've built that into your project plan timeline, then that's fine. Uh, if you haven't and you realize that you're running behind schedule and you need to now revise your project plan to include some kind of planning and preparation phase to actually get it all together uh, before uh, implementing, uh, you know, if it's, if it's enough of a delay that you really, your milestones and timelines are really not accurate anymore, we can work with you to revise your project plan to include some kind of ramp up time to get all this done. Uh, but certainly I think that, as Simbri has said a couple times now, there's no rush to get the EHP in if you don't at this time know exactly what you're trying to do. Uh, I think FEMA's assumption is that when the application went in, there was a good knowledge of what w was needed and what was going to be done. But we have the period of performance to work with. So again, if you don't know, uh, let's maybe focus our effort on getting the PMP done uh, and figuring out exactly what's going to happen. And then you'll be in a spot where you can actually take that knowledge and information fill out the EHP request form, get it approved by FEMA, and then implement. And again, nothing goes to FEMA. Everything comes to us through the SAASP uh, system so that it can be reviewed. And on behalf of the subrecipients, our agency will be the only entity that has contact with FEMA regarding your project. So nothing goes to FEMA directly. It comes to us to, instead. All right, so we are uh, actually at the, the hour mark. Uh, we might turn you loose a couple minutes early. Thank you for sticking around and uh, asking all the useful questions. Uh, we will uh, provide a recording of this uh, webinar on our website. It'll hopefully be useful to people who weren't able to make it or if you need a refresher. Uh, and then we'll also write up the, uh, the questions and answers that we uh, dealt with on this call uh, as well as any others. If you have any other questions, feel free to contact myself or Sembri. Uh, and uh, we will also be doing our probably our next uh, major communication uh, will be upcoming near the end of the year regarding how to submit the quarterly status report. Uh, and that's pretty straightforward. We'll probably just send out a written guide on how to do that in the SharePoint system. Happy holidays. Right. Thank you and goodbye.